this panel today, well, we know that, as they say, what we don't grow, we mine. So that means that the mining sector is, is in, in incredibly important for the global economy and it's not going anywhere. And especially for investors, it's a sector that would always be in their portfolios. However, as we know as well, uh, mining companies do have a responsibility to, to states, to the citizens of different countries, to the communities that um, are uh, located close to the mines and to the workers as well. So this means that uh, mining companies do have a way to behave and they need to um, um, also consider these ESG factors and understand how they impact their business, but also how the business impact these factors as well. And as a way as well to maintain their license to operate. So I'm very glad to be joined today by a very distinguished list of panelists and hopefully this conversation will be quite um, dynamic and useful for our audience today. So if we dive in um, directly to what we want to discuss, I would like to start with you, Terry. And I think, well, I mean, one topic that we're discussing in this session is responsible mining. But yeah, as we know, like in the ESG uh, world, there's a lot of jargon and there's a lot of um, uh, acronym. So my first question would be like, if you like, can you define responsible mining? So what does responsible mining look like? Thanks, Elena. And let me echo your, your thanks to the organizers for, for having us. Really a pleasure to be here. And I wish I was in Mexico. It would be very nice to be there in person. I'm speaking to you from, from London. But Mexico and mining across the world, I think, as, as Elena has said, is really important and is recognized as important. And I think that's, uh, that, that's be mindful of that. We, we need mining. We're going to continue to need mining. Uh, for making progress towards the sustainable development goals as set out by the UN, we, we need mining. And therefore, it's critical that we do that responsibly. And at the World Gold Council, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are a industry association representing the world's leading gold mining companies. We have 30 of the world's leading gold mining companies, many of whom operate in Mexico. And we got together a number of years ago and really was addressing the, the question you were just asking, Elena, as to there's so many different frameworks and approaches and uh, piecemeal um, uh, answers to what constitutes responsible mining, but how do we put it all together? And how do we uh, convey and communicate in a way that it is effective to investors, to communities, to employees, to civil society, to all stakeholders, that this mining is being undertaken responsibly. And so the World Gold Council and for the gold industry, we have set out the responsible gold mining principles that essentially defines the totality of the material issues associated with responsible gold mining, building on obviously all of the great practice that has been established over the years and I wouldn't want to suggest in any way that we've kind of the mining industry has just woken up and said oh let's be responsible. I think what's happening is how to pull together these ideas as to what constitutes responsible mining into a framework that is easily understood. And certainly for the gold sector, the responsible gold mining principles do that. I'm sure many viewers will be familiar with the cost framework that is used by the gold mining industry in terms of all-in costs and all-in sustaining costs. And it's a universal approach. And it's that universality of everybody operating in the same way that makes it really powerful, that it's very easy to understand what is being talked about. Looking forward, I think that we are going to see increasing convergence across these different approaches, standards, metrics, and I think that's to everybody's benefit. Um, at the same time, important to realize what it is that different audiences are looking for and, uh, and how to explain what constitutes responsible environmental, social and governance mining uh, in different contexts. And, and there are different contexts, partially in different parts of the world, partially based on um, different priorities of different stakeholder groups. So. Uh, I think it's exciting, the journey we're on, I think certainly from the investor community, and we spend a lot of time engaged with investors articulating the case for holding gold in a portfolio, we are getting more and more questions on ESG and people wanting to understand how gold can be thought of and recognized as an ESG credible asset, 
um, and, and build it into their portfolio. And then look, we're also getting broader questions on, on climate change, which is such a big theme in the investment community. Uh, and indeed, as I mentioned at the beginning, how the mining industry contributes to the sustainable development goals. Last year, we put out a report that looks at how when you operate responsibly, as defined by the responsible goal mining principles, there really is huge potential for this industry to contribute very meaningfully. But those are two sides of the same coin. You have to operate responsibly and you have to demonstrate and, 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 and uh, communicate the positive impact that responsible mining can have. Thank you so much, Terry. And then if I can go to Javier next, and I just wanted to ask, I mean, going from the comment that Terry just made that we see um, many things happen in the mining sector, many standards, many um, information pulling the mining sector in different directions. So could you tell us maybe more from your perspective, what should be the main macroeconomic trends that will impact the mining sector in the short and medium term? Um. Hi, Elena. Thanks for, for having me. And thank you, for Mexico Mining. So I, I would start with, with our own country, which is Mexico. And, and our expectation is for, for the recession that we had 2020 to just continue to 2021, which in a way for, for, for different metals, uh, it's going to be bullish. And, and of course, what, what we believe, uh, and just considering that we should care about the largest economy in the world, which is the US, what's going on specifically there. Uh, I guess, uh, which is good for us, but probably it's something we, we should be worried about is for the first time, uh, not even not, not even during the, during the second world war, the, the debt to GDP in the US, uh, it's gonna be above 140% for 2021. And, and I guess what I'm trying to say is, that debt is is unpayable, no? And and the reason I focus in the U.S. is because at the end the, the U.S. will will lead the way the the world will be into the future. And considering we are uh, very focused into into precious metals uh, as a bank and as a group, of course we're extremely bullish. And and I would say I'm I'm very biased in my comment because that's the way we are invested. But but we believe that the only way uh, I guess for the world to continue alive is continue with close to zero interest rates, because if it's, if it's not uh, that, then the debts around the world will just be unpayable. No? So we expect interest rate to be low. We expect uh, a very slow growth for the uh, whole world, which at the end, it's good for the people uh, that we are in this conference, that, that basically uh, we are invested in the mining sector ourselves, mostly in Mexico and Latin America. So uh, I guess, without saying that I'm that I'm happy for what we see it's happening especially in, in my own country Mexico uh, of course it's the opportunity of our life we've been investing since 2015 and accumulating assets uh, all over the all over the country and, and gladly we are well focused uh, and well uh, placed to, to to join this this trend of, of metal prices specifically precious metals continue their, their way up uh, into the following years. So we expect this mega uh, bull cycle, including copper and other metals to, to continue. And, and I would say as, 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 as a general rule, we, we believe that we'll see a slow growth all across the world. Thank you so much, Javier, for that um, comment. And if I can follow up that with a question for Matt, actually, I mean, listening to that particular scenario um, and thinking that, yes, we are in, I mean, the, the, the economy globally, I mean, uh, debt uh, levels are increasing, obviously economies around the world being hit by COVID-19 and people might sometimes worry that then ESG issues might take a, a, a um, back position on on in front of financial issues so could you tell us a little bit then from the perspective of an investor um then how do you do due diligence um in terms of esg issues on a single um asset company and then how do you link this to financial performance as well well I, thanks for I, the I guess, oops. I, for was the question for, for elena uh, it was for matt sorry <laughs> okay sorry yeah no, no problem javier thanks thanks for the question elena um I'll, I'll 
uh, answer it in reverse here. Um, you, you mentioned whether ESG is linked to, to financial returns, uh, particularly for a single um, com- uh, single asset company. And the, the answer is absolutely. Um, it, it goes hand in hand um, where, where you have a junior focused on a single asset. Um, all of those uh, investors' eggs are in, in one basket there. Um, and so in, in the MJG fund, when we're making investments, even if it's very early stage companies, uh, pre-discovery, post-discovery, um, we, we always want, if everything goes right, we want the, the project to be in a position to ultimately be sold um, to, to a major miner and, and brought into production. And there's plenty of opportunities in this space for, for a quick flip. Um, oftentimes, ESG is, is not considered by investors until far uh, further in, in the project life cycle as you get into the development and, and permitting stages. But I, I think it's uh, from an investment standpoint, it's in your best interest to consider it as early as, as possible. Because from a major minor perspective, uh, ESG and environmental concerns, they're more important than they've ever been in human history. And so I think as, as an investor, you need to, you need to keep, in, keep in that in mind. Um, you, you mentioned due diligence. Uh, and I will say, you know, the, the first thing that comes to mind, and it's something that I'm, I'm very much missing um, over the past year, but our, our site visits and the, and the opportunities to, to go to site, meet with management, uh, spend a few days there, you know, stay in the local community, perhaps, um, you know, truck, truck in and truck out of, of site. And once you're there in person, you get a whole uh, different, different view on, on, the, on the ESG situation, the project's proximity to local communities, uh, whether the, the asset and the deposit is near water sources, uh, which, which obviously could be sensitive, um, whether there are uh, sensitive areas historically nearby, um, what are relationships like with the, with the local community? Um, as you're going in and out of site, um, do you see mining nearby? Is it, is it in the culture? Um, it's, it's obviously far easier to get social license in a, in a community where mining has driven a, a healthy amount of employment in previous years, and, and much further um, in, in a community where, where it's, not, it's not been a, a form of employment um, ever. And um, I, I, I also say we'll focus on people a little bit here, and this, this is a bit cliche, but when you, when you hear somebody say, focus on serially successful teams, hopefully focusing on an asset uh, in a country where they've had previous success, uh, it's not just lip service. There's a reason for that. Um, if, you, if you have the success with, with a given country, with, with local regulators, um, with, with, with certain communities, uh, you, you can um, have, have a more trust in that management team that they've properly vetted all, all the ins and outs of, of, of a given asset. And then I'll also just say in, integrity and in ethics uh, is important. Um, if, if management treats uh, shareholders with, with respect and fairly and have, have a history of doing that, there's obviously no guarantees um, and, and you need to keep an eye out. But chances are when the lights uh, or when the spotlight's not on, there's a higher chance that they're dealing with, with the local communities in an equitable and, and fair manner. And that's, that's vitally important. Again, in the earlier stages of the development life cycle, you can cut corners and get away with it and still get rewarded from, from uh, the market. But eventually the piper will be paid. So it's absolutely, if you want to sell the, the company and, uh, and, and make money for your shareholders, you need to start early with your ESG approach. Thank you so much for that answer, Matt. And I think, yeah, I'm going to go back to, to the social issues question and relationship with communities later. But if we touch on the E of ESG and environment, I would like to pose a question to Michael, because obviously when we talk about a transition to a lower carbon economy, which is hugely important for dealing with climate change, we see that silver is going to take a center stage on this. So my question would be, yeah, what role do you see silver playing on this and what will be the most common applications um, going forward? Well, thank you. And thank you to the organizers of this conference. I must say, and I think the panelists will agree that the organization has been just terrific. And I had a chance to tune in yesterday and, and plan on doing so the rest of the day. Uh, just a really well, well done job. Um, like the World Gold Council, the Silver Institute's members are leading mining companies, refiners. We also have end use uh, um, users, manufacturers of silver products. So we're really engaged globally with respect to uh, uh, these issues. And you know, quite frankly, when you look at silver, it is truly a green metal. It is playing a vital role these days in not only new energy vehicles, but also its continuation in photovoltaics. These are two 
demand centers for silver and they play an important role in the decarbonization of our society. Uh, if you look at, for example, EV, electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles, and then the future, which is autonomous dri driving um, some five years down the road, silver is going to play a vital role um, in the electrical context and the components and the technologies that are necessary to, uh, to make these uh, uh, large scale applications um, continue throughout the world. There are many restrictions in, this, in, 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 in the United States. There are mandates now where taking California, for example, you can only, uh, I think there's a four year window where the, the, the ice combustion engines will be phased out. And the same thing in Massachusetts with respect to solar panels and um, um, photovoltaic use, the cost of the electricity generated from those applications has been driven down. The number of installations that will be going forth in various countries across the world will be increasing. So silver does play a very critical role in the decarbonization of our society. And that ties in very, very well with what we're here to speak about today. And the ESG issues are uh, very important to the mining industry as, as, as Terry alluded to. And um, our silver mining companies are as committed as, as ever to ensuring that uh, the metal that comes from the earth, silver, is done so in a very responsible manner. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. And James, if I can go to you again from an investor perspective. So what, what is the ability and obligation of investors to engage with mining companies to improve ESG practices? Because we hear from Michael and Terry that there is always a will to, to, to look into these issues and actually understand their impact and implement it. But as we know, there will be some actors in the mining sector that might not be uh, so bought to the idea. So from your perspective, what kind of questions and requests do mining companies um, expect from investors going forward? Yeah, great. Um, well, look, uh, I think that uh, the adage that comes to mind here is with great responsibility, with great uh, privilege comes great responsibility. And as investors in these companies, we have the most powerful voice in setting the course that the company uh, uh, is set on uh, uh, or will pursue and, and what management does and what the board looks like to oversee all of that. So we are ultimately architects of these companies. And what is really pretty terrible is that most of us don't think of ourselves that way. And maybe that's why we end up with so many companies not meeting their fiduciary responsibilities, which uh, I think have to include their engagement with the community and the environmental impact of their companies. Um, I think that if the world um, um, is managed more sensibly, companies are gonna have to pay a tax for their environmental pollution. Uh, or for the deterioration in environmental uh, uh, resources or for the use of environmental resources going forward. Uh, and so I think ultimately companies are going to be rewarded for paying attention to this anyway. But I think that until we get there, we investors have an extraordinarily important responsibility to impose uh, in, like really uh, uh, um, um, detailed, ideally, improvements in the um, emission of effluents or chemicals or toxic material into the environment. So I think that, um, the, 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 you know, look, uh, this is a really big question that could take up, I think, like two conferences like this, but I think Milton Friedman ended up planting the idea into all of our heads that a company's first and foremost responsibility is to generate profits. But actually, if you look at companies that are very well run, that are really quite profitable, by and large, they're led by management teams who also care about the welfare of their employees and the welfare of their communities and their environmental impact. And they happen to manage some of the most profitable companies in their sectors as well. So I really think that as investors, our first and foremost responsibility is to make sure that we appoint good management teams in this sector and strong boards who will hold them accountable. And I must admit, we all have to be honest and recognize the fact that on average, particularly the precious metals mining industry has been led by extraordinarily inept management teams that have destroyed an extraordinary amount of capital and certainly from an environmental and social perspective haven't distinguished themselves in any positive way at all. And so we really need to, I think, insist on 
a, a management teams who are much more thoughtful and much more effective and hold them to account for their failures. I think that we need to have boards that are much less clubby and much less entrenched with management and much more questioning of the practices that these companies pursue and frankly have the competencies required to lead a company that not only manages its minds and its resources well, but looks at decreasing the uh, chemical pollution in the water that is used in the mining process or in the rainwater or natural waters that is exposed to the mines as we unearth these assets. So as investors, to come back to your question, I think that we need to, in an ideal world, understand where the company is in terms of its community engagement and impact on the community and the way that it manages its water, especially usage, how much chemicals are we polluting uh, or we emitting into the environment and how do we decrease that? What are the specific new technologies we can adopt to decrease that? What are the specific changes in process that we can do uh, to decrease our environmental impact? And every company is riddled with plenty of unexplored opportunities because companies like this never like to change their process, uh, but change is a must. And as investors, we can demand it. And frankly, I think that we're the only ones who can demand it. And therefore we must. Yeah, thank you so much. That's yeah, James. I think you're um, exactly right. I mean, a lot of um, of the change has to come from from the top, and the commitment has to come from from the boards and the management of, of these mining companies. Um, I would like to go back to Terry, and I have a really long question for you. And I think it's a little bit well, I mean, connected to especially gold being one of the three TGs um, minerals, and who are considered conflict minerals. And obviously, we see that these minerals are highly regulated, uh, particularly in the US and in Europe. Um, so it, it's just, I mean, from that perspective, do you consider that regulation has been a main push in the gold mining? Um, and, and what are the factors at play? And also, what lessons can be applied to the development of public policy around other minerals as well? Sure. So look, there's no question regulations have played a role. But it's just one aspect that, that I think has led to, as uh, we've been talking about, increased focus on, on ESG factors. And, and again, um, this is not new. These are topics that the mining sector has been thinking about and considering and uh, working on for a long time. And, and if you look at some areas like health and, and safety, I mean, safety is integral to uh, how so many miners think about their operations. And obviously, that's the moral thing to do but it also uh it leads to better business performance and, and as james was saying if you can manage the esg factors well you're likely to manage the business well and i think that's really important and, and really understood and and, and i'll come on to the the, the 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 3tg and and the conflict mineral and regulation in a moment but just picking up on what what james was saying investors have a really important role to play and i think it's great that we're seeing uh investors really wanting to engage in, in conversations with management teams around ESG, both because it's the right thing to do, but also because it will support long-term value. And I think that mining companies um, have a lot to say about what they are doing, at least responsible mining companies have a lot to say about what they're doing and the steps they take uh, to ensure that they are looking after the environment, paying attention to their communities, getting their governance right, and want to be engaged in those conversations with with investors sometimes it's been hard because uh there isn't a if you like a, a good playing field in terms of being able to have that conversation in a way that both sides can understand where the other one's coming from and so almost going back to where i started and and metrics and and the responsible gold mining principles in particular are really designed to do that that are allowed to, just like a, a gap and and accounting standards allow everybody to understand what it is, what financial performance is. I think we're moving to a world where we're getting a level playing field for what ESG expectations are and holding management teams to account on that. And certainly all members of the World Gold Council, 30 the world's leading gold mining companies have committed to implement the IGMPs. And a part of that is around wanting to be um, having those conversations with investors and explain to investors why responsible ESG management is the right thing to do and leads to better long-term performance. So I think we're in a, in a really good place overall in terms of the evolution. Um, but just coming back to the specifics of, of the question, yeah, I think regulation is a driver, um, but just one. I think the fact that gold was grouped in that 
uh, cluster of minerals that were the so-called conflict minerals um, undoubtedly has put additional scrutiny on, on gold supply chains. Uh, and there are many aspects of that that are, that are good. There are also some aspects of that that are frankly a little bit misguided in the way that it's been implemented. And, and in particular, if you look at uh, Dodd-Frank and 1502 and the requirement on all the companies listed in the US to be able to identify essentially to the atom where each gold molecule comes from, um, it is just unfeasible. So there are better approaches. The OECD has done a lot of fabulous work in this area, and that's the approach that's been followed by, uh, by the European Union. And I think that's very sensible and speaks to raising responsible sourcing due diligence standards along gold supply chains. So regulation is good and it can be helpful, but it needs to be thoughtfully constructed. And just one final point on, on where regulation can sometimes be, be challenging, we haven't yet really talked about artisanal mining. And actually, when you look at the broader landscape in precious metals and certainly in gold, uh, a significant amount of total global supply does come from artisanal miners. And it's there are some very uh, worthy and notable exceptions, but unfortunately, the vast majority of artisanal gold mining uh, is associated with poor environmental and social practices. And one of the challenges is how to bring those that, that metal and those, uh, those miners into the formal economy and encourage them to develop improved environmental, social, and indeed governance practices, rather than put up regulatory barriers that say, no, we're not gonna touch the, the gold that comes from there because they will still mine gold and it will just go to different places. So in short, regulation is a helpful step along the way but you have to be quite careful in how it's applied. And I would really encourage industry participation because responsible actors want to help, want to support building a, an industry and a supply chain that really does do what it's there to do, which is um, produce the metal and enrich the lives of everybody who's involved in, 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 in and around the mine site. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, I think it's, it's an important point. I mean, sometimes regulation comes as a last resort and um, as a solving a problem. Um, so yeah, it's important for investors and companies to to take part on the on the uh, dialogue and make sure that yeah, regulation is there to help the issue and not necessarily hinder it. So so it's good to to get your perspective on that. And thank you so much for bringing the topic of the artisanal miners. I think that is very important one. And also, I mean, obviously, yeah, the the social issues around artisanal miner are quite um, yeah grave and and one that requires um, full attention. And I guess yeah, with that, I would ask Matt and thinking uh, again. Uh, we say that obviously mining is necessary for the low carbon economy transition and there is a lot of opportunities uh, for mining to enter uh, the green to access green financing. However, we also see that as uh, the increase of demand of mine, uh, minerals, um, we also see an increase in allegations of abuses of human rights. So then how do you, yeah, how do you manage that dichotomy or how do you engage with companies so they have the access to the green financing, but also take into account the social issues of their operations and just making sure that we're not um, investing in something just because it's green uh, and disregarding the possible social consequences. Yep, so it's a good question. <clears throat> and I, I do think we're, we're in surge uh, in, in store here for a surge of, uh, of green, green bonds and ESG financing um, into the mining space here. Um, you know, from a historical perspective, uh, the, the, the market as a whole is, is very underinvested to, to hard assets. And so I think there's going to be a natural swing of the pendulum back, both for, for equity and, and debt investors. Um, but it will be through this ESG lens. Um, you know, pretty incredible research coming out of, out of Europe here that's saying by 2025, um, literally 50% of all mutual funds um, uh, and NAV will, will be ESG focused. So 50% of the, of the total European mutual fund industry will be ESG focused, which is pretty, pretty wild numbers, and they're going to need mining exposure. Um, so so we're, we're in good shape there. I think you want to look at things uh, on a case by case basis, at least if you're looking at individual assets. And there's a whole laundry list of, of things that um, banks and financiers will, will go through um, to determine whether a certain mining opportunity 
um, is, is deserves this ESG financing. So we'll look at energy efficiency um, due to the type of mining operation and uh, and processing. Um, they'll look at where the energy comes from. Um, is, is our solar panels or wind turbines uh, supplying um, the, the processing plants or is it being pulled um, from the grid or are they constructing a coal plant nearby in order to, to power operations? Um, what are CO2 uh, emissions uh, relative to, to peers? Um, you know, what are uh, local and community relations looking like? Um, and are there, are there benefits for local communities uh, simply beyond jobs? Uh, maybe there's an economic incentive. Maybe there's a royalty. Um, conversely, maybe all the money is going to the central government of whatever company or country is being operated in, um, which is which is obviously far worse from a community relations standpoint. Um, what is the tailings disposal? That's that's another very important point of uh, focus, especially if you're focused on the uh, in the nickel space. Um, there's been some recent um, developments out of Indonesia, where uh, fortunately, from my perspective. Indonesian government seems to be turning against deep sea tailings disposal, um, which is a pretty harmful uh, envir uh, practice environmentally, at least of, of uh, disposing of wet tailings. So that's going to be a point of, of particular particular interest. So each project needs to be evaluated on all those merits. Um, I, I will say, though, generally, um, I do think that certain metals will absolutely have an edge here in, in the coming years in terms of uh, attracting green financing. Uh, you know, examples, copper and you know, nickel, lithium. Metals that help us power um, our, our 21st century society and are essential in our move to, to a fully electrified society, I think we'll have a clear advantages over iron ore, zinc, or metals that are essential to uh, the way we live but don't have that, that green um, edge. Um, you know, silver uh, is probably going to be uh, easier, easier sell than gold. And uh, I, know, I know Terry would, would maybe, maybe disagree with, with that. Um, he, made a, he made a compelling case earlier. Um, but as, as Michael was mentioning, um, I, I think these, these industry groups should do their very best jobs to, to highlight and, and put at the forefront the green applications that their metals are, are necessary uh, uh, to, to power. And then I would just say, you know, generally for investors that want to get a sense of where a given metal stands um, on the ESG and, and green financing front, uh, the World Bank did come out with a, a very interesting study last year um, titled uh, Minerals for Climate uh, Action. And so there's, there's a, a concrete list there of particular metals that, that they're focused on and view as essential for this green er energy revolution. And I think those that are on the list and are, are regarded as so um, will, will be beneficiaries or greater beneficiaries of this, of this uh, green financing trend. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know if uh, Michael or Terry would like to to reply to that in terms of from your from your perspective. Sure, I, I'd be happy to. And then and Terry can follow up here. Um, I, I do believe what Matt and Terry both said is, is, is 100 percent on target. I think that as 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 the as the industry evolves and taking the Silver Institute and the silver industry as an example, we have increasingly been contacted by banks, other groups, and so forth to get a fingerprint on our mines, low carbon um, or their carbon energy reporting. And there were really up to now, there has not been a project that has been undertaken in the, in the silver space, but we are doing that right now through all of our member companies and also those that aren't currently member companies. I think they wanna see these, this information um, with respect to potential investment and um, for shareholders and so forth. The good news is, is that most of our mining companies already do produce this and contain that material in their sustainability reports. So um, we just need to collate it and get it into one, one, um, one area, which the Silver Institute will be the champion of. But in terms of the green metals, and, and uh, we do believe that silver will be a green metal. We've done reports on the green revolution and silver's role. Uh, we did a report earlier this year on silver and autos, focusing specifically on battery elected vehicles, hybrid vehicles, and the future of autonomous driving. And of course, on the solar side as well. But one aspect I did leave out earlier is silver's role in water purification. And as a natural antibacterial, it's, it, it's, it's long use and it's, it's foreseeable use as, a, as an agent to help, especially in countries where there are challenges with respect to clean water. 
Um, we will play, the industry will play, our mining companies and the companies that produce these wa this water will play a role and help, the, help, help more sustainable and healthy lives. And, and if I can just come in there as well, and, and look, it's fascinating always to me when you look at the way in which gold is used as a, if you like, an industrial metal. Um, it's used in tiny quantities at nanoparticular level, but photovoltaics uh, very often have a, a, a gold nanoparticles or a thin layer of gold to help improve the efficiency. Um, looking at catalytic converters and, and the role that gold can play, particularly as you look to hydrogen based economies and, and how gold might play there. And just more broadly, the role gold plays as a, as a connector. We wouldn't be having this conversation now if there wasn't gold because it's uh, in, in the computers that everybody is sat working on. What I think of those really interesting is, is gold's role actually in, um, in healthcare technologies and uh, rapid diagnostic testing testing kits that are being rolled out now at great speed um, uh, for, for, for COVID, um, but have also been used for a long time for malaria, uh, for TB, uh, are activated by gold nanoparticles. And so there are a range of fascinating um, technology applications and, uh, and, and gold, there's lots going on in terms of looking at the role for gold. The, the one final thought I would say on, on climate change is it's been a lot of discussion on uh, the need for the metal, which I think is right and important. But part of that is also actually thinking about how investors manage their portfolios in light of climate impacts. And we're going to see, we already are seeing significant repricing. We're seeing stranded assets. Um, and I'm not just talking about in the mining sector, real estate near, near coastal areas is going to already go through significant pricing. You're going to see this across equities, all sorts of, um, of areas. And from an investor perspective, thinking about how you build some climate resilience into your portfolio uh, is increasingly going to be an important part of an investor's job. We think there's a really strong case that gold is actually very likely to be an asset class that does bring additional climate risk resilience, if you like. Um, incremental emissions associated with gold once it's produced are de minimis. In fact, it's one of the really interesting things about the gold industry that so much of the emissions are associated at the mining phase, uh, which is unlike most other commodities and means that if you can decarbonize there, you really can get to zero. Uh, and we put out some work on that. And if anybody's interested, happy to talk more about it or take a look at our website. But particularly for investors that are thinking about how to construct a climate risk resilient portfolio, we think that's going to lead to more interest and more demand for gold. And let's not underplay the important role that gold plays as a source of financial security. Uh, and, and if I could just add to that, I think that trying to uh, discuss the relative appeals of gold versus silver is, is like uh, trying to discuss uh, uh, the relative appeal of Los Angeles versus uh, San Francisco, you know, at the beginning of the 17th century. Nobody cared about either, and people are extraordinarily underinvested in both sectors. Uh, and I think that um, while the time frames here will be much, much uh, more brief, I think that, um, as uh, Terry just said, given the extraordinary and unprecedented and frankly unfathomable in context and in, 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 in magnitude uh, amount of money that's been printed, um, the repercussions, particularly for gold, uh, but also for silver, are extraordinary. And these repercussions will only assert themselves over time monetary policy doesn't affect the price of assets like this within a year or two. It does it over a three to five to sometimes longer term time frame. And this kind of magnitude we've never seen before. So the time frame associated with it is a complete unknown. But I think it's worth, I, I, I would think that uh, uh, both gold and silver are extraordinarily well-placed uh, uh, industries uh, to invest into and extraordinarily neglected and underinvested in uh, and have, uh, I think, shockingly bright futures um, and uh, the relative appeal of one versus the other, I think, is, is we're all in on gold, I must admit. Uh, but, but I think that uh, it's going to be a really interesting and attractive area to invest into. Thank you so much. And Javier, if I could go back to you, because obviously we've been looking a lot of our global trends and what is happening in Europe, Asia and the US. But from the Mexican perspective, do you see ESG issues then taking more center stage or what are the main um, risks and opportunities in this area that you see for the Mexican context? 
Well, I, I guess for us, uh, it has to be a given, no? So the way we invest is basically in publicly traded companies with assets in Mexico. The reason being is because uh, the most important thing should be transparency. And of course, we don't even question ESG because that, that should be a given, no? Uh, but, but I would say that the, 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 the basically the, the three main countries that we invest through, which is Australia, Canada, mostly Canada and the US, of course, ESG is, is top of the list, and, and, and these countries are extremely good to implement policies, at least in all the companies that we participate. So for us, I guess that has been always a given, and not just in mining, in any sector that we invest. We do invest a lot in the organic sector. And, and for us, it, it has to be that way. And that's what we see best practices from, from these three main juris, jurisdictions go. Thank you. Thank you for that overview. And yes, I guess, I mean, if I go back to um, Michael and then just going back again to the question and what Matt was talking about as well in terms of tailings management and uh, yeah, human rights and, and the possible increase in demands of the minerals. So how, how are you seeing the industry balancing these ESG issues? Like, I mean, obviously we know that, yeah, silver is going to take center stage, but what else are you doing in terms of the other impacts that an increase in demand could have in terms of human rights or um, waste management? Well, we're putting an increased focus on our member companies' work that they've been doing for a number of years in these areas. Uh, we released our sustainability project last year. We're continuing to build on it. And we don't want it just to be some glossy photo shoot of kids at a school and so forth. We really want it to have meaning and be meaningful to not only the societies to, and, and, and the countries to which or in which these uh, uh, mining activities are participating, but also throughout the world. So I mentioned earlier, we're doing our low carbon study and so forth, something that is, is inherently necessary for, for the industry. But one thing we have to really point out here is that silver mining is, is, is you know, 70% of silver that comes from a mined activity is from a byproduct resource. So whether that be gold, whether that be lead, whether that be zinc or iron or any other metal, only 30% comes from what's known as a primary silver mine. So we're working in context with our member companies um, to address these issues. We feel comfortable in that we are out front. Um, I can't think of a member company that would, would that would stand for these abuses, um, but then again, they do occur uh, across the world through all mining activities. And I think collectively, the mining industry needs to get a handle on this. And I think we're starting to do so. And I know from the Silver Institute's perspective, and from our members' perspective, that's something that we are all in on. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I guess, James, I mean, uh, thinking we've been discussing this already in terms of uh, obviously investors understanding the exposure that the portfolios have, and then obviously mining companies doing better or worse in these practices. So we see, I mean, for smaller investors that have less leverage and, and of the companies in their portfolios, like what do you recommend for them to do so they can increase leverage and increase engagement with mining companies? I think fundamentally, I would recommend that they don't think about themselves as a small or large investor, but as an investor and therefore um, a, a powerful stakeholder, right? A stakeholder that's in the driver's seat. Um, at the end of the day, unless you own, the fact is, unless you own 50% plus one share of a company, you cannot exert your will on that company, right? And so any change that investors uh, hoist upon the management teams and the boards of the companies that they invest in is done in aggregate. Any opinion or change in strategy that's adopted is one that makes sense. And maybe management board came up with it uh, by themselves and didn't need investor input. But if ever investors have influence over management and the board, it's because there's a large swath of them that sing from the same hymn sheet and come to share the same views. Um, but it's never one investor you know, that, that does things in a, in a vacuum, right? Like even if I own 20% of a company and I have a really well-developed idea that happens to not be very good um, and other investors don't agree with me and management and the board doesn't agree with me, if I own 20, 25, 30, 35%, 40%, I'm probably not going to have my way. Do you know what I mean? So I think that it all begins with a very good idea. And I actually, I was thinking about your question and I think it's the easiest thing in the world, but also the hardest thing in the world. The hard part is doing your homework, 
do your homework and come up with what you think the company should do differently and why. And don't just say, well, I think you should explore this because this. You need to have really detailed analysis around the proposals that you're making and what their effect would be and why that effect would be positive. And you need to really substantiate that because people, you know, pont this is not a time for pontification, right? But once you've put together a really thorough and robust analysis and have some of the most important experts in the world and on that company conducting that work for you, or if you reach out to them and consult with them and whatever, and have a really thoughtful plan, then what you do is actually very simple. Send an email to the management team, send an email to the board, and CC their largest investors, okay? That's basically like, and they will for sure respond to you because their largest investors are uh, 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 CC. It's kind of like, you know, calling someone and saying, I think you're committing a crime. By the way, on the line with me are is like the sheriff, the head of the police department, your local uh, uh, state representative or whatever. Assuming that the sheriff and the state representatives weren't as corrupt as they seem to be in America these days on average, it's just, we have governance problems in this country, but, um, I think that you actually have all the power that you need to affect change. But what you really do need to do, which is difficult, I understand, for a small investor, but it's also difficult for a large investor, is do really good, thorough work with great authorities on the subject. Uh, and that takes time and it takes effort. It doesn't necessarily take resources if you're creative. And what... Um, I think often disappoints me is that people do not invest the time and the resources to develop really detailed views on the projects and the companies and the ESG considerations that they're investigating. In. And that's what you really need to do, I think. But, you know, I also have to, uh, so that's my answer. I also have to echo what Michael said. I really think that this conference, completely different topic, is extraordinarily well organized. I just have never been part of such a thoughtful, you know, well curated and heavily uh, uh, micro organized conference. And I do think that it talks about Mexico's commitment to this industry. And I think that that's another really important topic that we haven't discussed is, you know, the, the, the jurisdiction in which a company operates ultimately ends up being for us the most important consideration. You can have a wonderful company with the best management teams and greatest ores, and it could be in Zimbabwe, you know, and we're just not going to touch it because there's no governance there that we could rely on. There's no history of respecting private property for decades and decades, and the government is unstable and not to be relied upon. But I think that governments like Mexico's that clearly um, 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 uh, create a stable environment for investors to allocate capital and for companies to operate uh, end up uh, uh, making these investments possible to begin with and end up allowing us to do our work in a more kind of enlightened way um, subsequently. So, uh, so thank you. I, I want to, if, if I could just jump in quickly, I think, I think James made a, a great point in how, you know, individual smaller shareholders can, can reach out directly to the company. And um, I, I know uh, or my understanding is James is more of an activist uh, tilt in his investing style. So he does not hear back from management or the board or any of the shareholders, but that's probably going to steal his resolve and he'll double down, maybe get more aggressive. But as an individual shareholder, if you send, it, send a thoughtful email with reasonable concerns and you follow up with the company and you don't hear back from them, then to me, that's a pretty good litmus test and a good sign that this probably isn't the company that should be in your portfolio. They're not taking your concerns uh, seriously as a shareholder. And they also aren't taking the ESG side of things carefully because any company worth their salt should be on it for these types of, of requests, especially in today's environment. I, I would reply to that, Matt, if I made that we get very excited when we find that there's a great man, there's a great asset and a safe jurisdiction and wonderful operations and bad management like that for us is the most exciting thing in the world because that's when we know that if you send an email like that to a management team, and don't hear about them, you're frustrated. Imagine, being a huge investor in that company and having a, stood by that company for years and having seen the value of your investment erode. And imagine how frustrated you might be then, like you're very professionist tied to this investment. And so usually the companies that we invest in are like that. They're great companies, great assets, really bad management teams. And either they're changing because there's a new management team or new strategy or new board or whatever, or we work with our fellow investors to affect change. Um, so, you know, I would, for us, uh, we're activist investors. We certainly don't see confrontation, but we don't run from it at all. Um, if, if we find great company plus bad management, that usually for us is a pretty winning formula. Don't, don't run away from it. Double down on these people. I <laughs> let but this is the <laughs> shareholders and their chief legal counsel and your favorite, you know, um, um, uh, journalist at the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times. 
you know, yeah. they will respond to that. That I can guarantee you. Right. I respect your approach, James, but I, I would say generally, especially in this junior space, there are a lot of fish in the sea. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong uh, hit, hitting the door and, and working with, with more credible people. Um, but yeah, that said, if you if you have the, the group involved and the the technical resources to, to play an act, uh, activist role, there's money to be made as well, and it's healthy for the industry. So thank you. Oh, I, I would agree with you. Yeah. yeah, I think we're nearing to the end of the session today. So before we go, I just wanted to give a couple of minutes to all of you just to give some final remarks, and I'll start on the order of my screen. So Javier, if I can start with you, any final thoughts on on today's discussion? Yeah, I guess I, I, I agree 100% with, with James and Matt and, and everybody's comments. 50% uh, has to be the asset and the jurisdiction. And of course, I'm Mexican, so most of our investments are in Mexico. And the other 50% is, 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 is management uh, and the board itself. But I would agree with them that, that most of the investments that we like difficult situations where management is really bad and the board as well, and we go in uh, and I guess restructure the whole company. Uh, of course, assuming that the asset is the is the right asset. Uh, and I and, and for the Mexicans in the in the audience, um, and of course my 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 other international uh, uh, people. I mean, what I would say is that of course Mexico has a, a huge opportunity. Reason being because there's lack, there's a, a a really big uh, hole in terms of financing. Uh, Mexico, even though it's one of the most important mining jurisdictions in the world, uh, basically it's not finance at all. No? So uh, as a commercial, I would say that, that we are the, the most, we've been for the last decade, the most important mining bank in the country. Mm -hmm. and, and, and not because we're smart, just because we happen to be the only one. No? So, so that brings a lot of opportunity to finance projects of, with good management. And, and we are doing it in a way that we provide uh, debt through the bank, uh, equity through our funds. And, and when, when the room is there, we do either royalty or streams through our partners, in these cases, Empress Mining and, and, and Endeavor in the UK. So I guess Mexico, as, as, as uh, James was saying, even though there's many things that we have to improve as a country, uh, I think that the mining rules are there. Uh, and, and the projects, I guess we're blessed by nature, by nature in terms of natural resources. And, and well, with many of you, uh, I've been coming to this conference for many, many years and, 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 and I'm very, uh, thank you guys for inviting me again. And, and as a bank, we are here to serve and, and basically walk you through the whole process of the, of the mining process all the way from exploration to production, we invest and finance different stages. And, and also on the supply chain side, we are heavily invested in, in the mining sector. So thank you again for, for, for having me and, and, and thank you to all my uh, panelists, friends. Yeah, thank you, Javier. And I think well, I'm gonna go next to Michael and I would say, yes, if we can keep the Mexican perspective in mind, it would be great for your final thoughts as well. Yes, um, again, thank you so much for this great conference. You know, we get down to Mexico several times a year. Uh, Mexico is the world's largest silver producer. And our commitment to that country remains very strong and will go so as we go forward. My only concern is, is that with the success of this online conference, that uh, many of these across the world will be continued to be online. But we really need to get back to the face-to-face -face meetings to the, um, the, the, the personal communication and so forth. And I've been to this conference several times and it is a terrific opportunity to network. It's a terrific opportunity to learn. And I know that the Silver Institute remains committed to Mexico. And I just wanna thank you again for this great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Next one on my screen is Matt. Thank you, Elena. This is a, this has been a fun conversation. I appreciate you you moderating. Um, <clears throat> I will say for for Mexico, it's the fifth largest uh, jurisdiction uh, by weighting um, within the the MJG portfolio. Um, so it's a it's a country that we we have a healthy amount of exposure to. Um, and I just I just want to reiterate, especially um, that we're now that we're at the earlier stages of what I'd argue is going to be a pretty healthy mining bull market here. 
for, for industry representatives and investors and all of us to do our best to, to keep our head, um, you know, keep, keep the greed to, to a minimum, uh, act responsibly, work with good people, um, treat, treat each other fairly, um, whether it's local communities or, or on the environmental front. Um, I think it's an incumbent on us to be to be good good stewards here, um, and uh, it's it's also mutually uh, beneficial as well. So it seems like everybody on this this panel is doing their their part, and I and I appreciate that. Let's let's keep it up. Thank you, Terry. Look, I think there were many concerns in, in, at the beginning of uh, the COVID pandemic that ESG would cease to be important. That in uh, needing to maintain livelihoods and, and help just get through the crisis, concerns around environmental social governance would fall away. In fact, the opposite happened. And I think it has exaggerated and it, sorry, exacerbated and identified just how important it is that collectively we uh, seek to look after the environment, to support communities and, and neighbours, and that we have the right governance arrangements in place that allow for an equitable distribution of, of wealth. And in many ways, you could say that ESG and gold were two of, if not the biggest themes from an investing perspective in, in 2020. I think we're going to see that going forward as well. Mexico has a really important role to play in, in both. And, uh, and I think it's been an excellent conversation. And I hope it's helped to demonstrate why ESG is important, why ESG is here to stay, and how it needs to be integrated into the part of the dynamic when thinking about precious metals. Thank you so much. And last but by no means least, James. Hi. Uh, well, look again, thank you very much for having me on this uh, um, awesome panel. And I'm really looking forward and hopeful to, to stay in touch with, uh, with my um, co-panelists because uh, there's some really interesting thoughts that have been expressed here. Um, I think uh, a couple of things. Um, one is on Mexico's importance. It's actually quite exciting. There's a tangible of amount of excitement that I feel when I hear Matt talk about Mexico in the terms that he does and, and what Terry says. And, you know, look, again, if we come back to the adage that um, with great privilege comes great responsibility, well, Mexico is privileged with um, a lot of natural resources and, and delicious food, by the way, um, and a whole bunch of other great things. Uh, maybe um, there is room for Mexico to be the way in terms of um, uh, sustainable mining and in the development and the promotion of uh, really neat uh, uh, um, um, mining technologies and mining processes. And there's a number of companies that we've studied that have come up with new mining techniques and processes that decrease the impact of the process on the environment. And how cool would it be for a government to actually formally study some of these different companies and make introductions to some of the largest mining projects in their territory and perhaps provide incentives for the adoption of these processes and really paint, uh, uh, pave a really thoughtful and quite extraordinary, but completely sensible and frankly necessary path that other people, you know, in, including in my country, which is Canada, even though I sit in the US, uh, and in, um, you know, even countries like the US, which until recently didn't seem to have been particularly concerned about environmental impact of, uh, of, of its industries at the top level, maybe other countries could follow. Uh, I think that there's really a need for that. I think there's a need to promote and to develop and to increase the recognition of a whole bunch of new companies and processes and technologies that we need to adopt. And maybe we can speed these things up. So that's one thought that comes to mind. Um, another thought that I would have is just, uh, um, you know, it's astounding to me that uh, we um, that put people on management uh, teams that, and we expect them to care about the environment, uh, but they have no nothing in their background that suggests that this is a concern of theirs, you know? Uh, and so I really would feel much better appointing someone to the board of a company who personally has spent time with like Pachamama, you know, which is a nonprofit that prevents oil development in, in the Amazon or like Human Rights Watch or like some of these other organizations that, you know, clearly would show that this individual is personally aligned with um, um, the direction that the company should go into. And I think that without these clear external markers, because forgive me, management teams, they're not necessarily known for being truthful and portraying things as they actually are. But I think that at the end of the day, if you know what someone personally stands for, you likely know what they will professionally stand for. And the fact that we never equate the two is to me like pretty 
you know, we certainly suggest that there's a lot of room for improvement. And then on the idea of a small investor or a big investor or whatever, I think size doesn't matter. If you're an investor, you're in one of the most powerful seats in the world. You can tell your management teams and management teams of the most important companies in the world what to do from a position of strength. Uh, and the more thoughtfully you articulate your point and the more um, uh, uh, substantially you make your case, the more likely you are to be taken seriously and, and for your uh, observations or recommendations to be adopted. And if you do it extraordinarily thoughtfully and substantially, then you have to be, your views have to be adopted if they're the correct ones. So I think that all it points to is just the importance of work. Do your work, you know, get your analysis done in detail and don't give up until your recommendations have been adopted if they clearly and inarguably make sense.